Okay. Um, all right, so we're almost to lunch, so uh, one more hopefully interesting talk. Um, my name is Austin Bingham. I work for and part own um, 60 North that you can see up there. Uh, the other half of 60 North, North is the guy in the blue shirt here, Rob. Um, and we are, have historically been kind of a C++ uh, Python sort of oriented consultancy. Like we have a lot of experience in that. And it was about, I guess, two years ago that I first started looking into Elm as, a, as an escape hatch from some horrible JavaScript I was working on. Um, and it has been um, a growing part of what we do as a business. We're actually getting uh, requests for Elm Consulting uh, now, some exotic you know, cryptocurrency stuff from the Caribbean. It's very exciting. But there's, there's a market for this stuff. It, it's, it's cool. So, um, and and um, it, it feels like a wave is building for Elm, and it's very exciting for us, and I, I think for, for a lot of you as well. And we've seen a lot of the reasons that's the case. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, well, you can read the title, a Jupyter Elm kernel, uh, interactive notebooks for Elm. Who here knows what IPython or Jupyter is? Okay, good. And that's about half the room, I'd say. Um, they are interactive notebooks. This, 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 they, they come from the, mostly from the scientific Python community, this, this idea that you could have markdown documents interleaved with code that can be executed and have these well, scientific notebooks. That's why they're called notebooks. Um, behind the scenes, there's this thing called a kernel, and we'll look at some details, that translates you know, originally just the Python code, but now they've ex expanded the framework so you can plug in different kernels for different languages. And I thought it would be cool to have one for Elm. The original plan was to do a, a use it for um, slides for a presentation about Elm, and it turned out that that wasn't a great way to present about Elm, but um, now I'm giving a presentation about a presentation technology that I didn't actually use. But I'm going to actually use that technology here, so it's, it's all come full circle, so um, everybody wins, right? Um, so. What is a Jupyter Notebook? You can read the jupyter.org. It's an open source web application that you know, lets you have live code, equations, visualizations, and explanatory text. Not terribly helpful. Um, the thing that we're going to do now is actually look at one of these. And this will be using the Elm kernel. So let's open up a actual, is that it's big enough for you guys? OK, good. Um, so this is a Jupyter Notebook uh, that's running with the Elm kernel in the background. So you see the first cell, this first highlighted square rectangle, is just some you know, introduction, what is the Elm architecture. I'm not going to try to teach you guys about the Elm architecture. but um, So I'm going to execute that cell, does nothing. And then I have some explanatory text saying, OK, first we have to import a few things for our code to work. Now we've come to a block of code. And this is obviously a bunch of Elm imports. If I execute this cell, well, OK, it's going to run the code. That executed very quickly and actually did nothing. It just shipped a bunch of code over to the kernel and said, hold on to this. We're going to execute this in a bit once you have everything that you want to do. So we can step through the rest of this. We define some messages. We talk about what a model is. We talk about a view function. Things are getting more interesting. Oh, an update function. This is a real program all of a sudden. Now we say we have main. And main has the blob of code that ties everything together. And you'll notice this last little bit of code is a comment that says compile code. And this is one of the minor hacks in the way I've done all, done, wired all this together. The idea is that the kernel has been gathering up all these code cells and kind of putting them into a queue. And we'll look at the implementation in a second. When it sees a cell that ends in compile code, it says, ah, OK, take all that, concatenate it together, compile it, run it through the Elm, you know, run it through Elm make, and then ship the results back to the browser. So I'm going to execute that, and you'll see it's got a little star. It's thinking. It's actually going out, and Elm make is running, downloading packages, compiling everything. And eventually, you know, we get this wonderful output, and we have you know, a mind-blowing program now that lets us do, you know, it's a legitimate Elm program, right? Um, so thank you. Thank you for the. <laughs> I didn't expect to get, to get claps for that. It's a you know, pretty underwhelming program, but you get the point. And so hopefully, what I, what I want to get across in this section is to give you a sense of the possibilities. Uh, Jupyter notebooks are used very, very widely in the Python community um, to do all sorts of stuff, a lot of it having to do with education, presentations, communicating complex ideas to other people. And I thought it would be a great way to try to teach people about Elm, and that it just for various reasons didn't work out. But if I can plant the seed in your minds, maybe you'll go out and start using it to do exciting things as well. And we can grow this tool into something that is as useful for Elm programmers as it has been for Python programmers. So that's the end of that little bit of the demo. The rest of this um, talk is going to be about how this is built. And so I'm going to subject you all to several slides of Python code. So I hope you can, hope you can deal with that at an Elm conference. Um, talk a little bit about what a kernel really does. So a kernel 
for this is from ipython.org, is a program that runs and introspects users' code. Not terribly helpful. From a more concrete point of view, it receives code from the client like we just saw. It runs the code for some definition of run. Clearly, we don't execute the code every time some code is shipped. We wait until the right time. And then we return the results as well as a status indicator to the client. So very straightforward. The Elm kernel works in a slightly weird way compared to other languages. So we accumulate these code cells. As they come into the kernel, we just kind of queue them up. And then we look, as I mentioned, for this compile code comment. Once we have all the code that we want to compile, we put it into a temporary file. We ask Elm make to run over it. And then we ship things back. Um, I have this, this last bullet here about Elm stuff. As an optimization, the temporary directory lasts as long as the kernel is kept alive. And you can control how long the kernel is kept alive. And as long as the kernel is alive, we keep around the Elm stuff directory as an optimization to speed up. Um, if you have a very long, complex notebook, you might be doing several compilations that all use the same packages, typically. And so this is a, it's an optimization that is not optional right now. And it may turn out to be a bad idea. But these are the kinds of things that if you look at it and go, that's a really dumb idea, let me know. Or make an issue or a pull request or something. We can talk about how to build this. My main motivation for talking about a lot of this with you guys is to get your help, to get you people using it and telling me how it's broken, how we could do things better, and things like that. And that's also the reason I'm going to show you how it works, so that I can get you, you know, booted into it. So um, Python code. The very first thing that happens during kernel initialization is we, we create this list underscore code, and we create a temporary directory. Right? And so the code is the thing that we're just going to drop these code cells into and build up this, this queue of things we want to compile all at once. So um, I guess a note on Python. I, I don't expect everybody here to know Python that well. I'm going to kind of talk through some of the code, um, but don't worry if you don't understand how some things work. Come talk to me later if you really want to know, and we can, we can discuss it. But there's nothing very exotic in the Python that I'm using either. The, the, the interesting things start to happen when a user executes a cell. So they, they've, they've been in their notebook, and they say, execute this particular cell, and it ships a blob of code, you know, text source code, over to the, the kernel. The very first thing we do is this append call. So we just stick that code blob onto the end of the list we've been maintaining. And then we ask, should I compile? And all that really is saying is, look at the last element in code and see if it ends with this little, this little hack, this little uh, signal saying to compile. If so, we join everything together using you know, slash in into one big code blob. We empty out the code list, and we just call compile, which we'll look at in a second. Um, there are two things that could happen at this point. One is that an exception could come out of the compile call. And that means that something fatal happened, like you couldn't find Elm make or something along those lines. It doesn't mean the code didn't compile. It means we couldn't even try to compile it. Um, and in that case, we send an error back. And otherwise, we send back a status saying OK, along with some other stuff that gets sent out of band. We do have time. Good. Um, things get a bit more interesting now because we're trying to actually compile the code. So now we've got the code coming in to this function is the complete set of code that we want to compile all at once. So we create two temporary files. Actually, we just invent two temporary file names. These go in that temporary directory, and these bind to in file and out file. We write our code into a JavaScript, or into an Elm file, sorry, and then we try to compile it. And we'll look at that on the next slide. Uh, two things could happen here. Um, well, several things could happen here. We could get a called process error, which means basically that the process Elm make exited with a non-zero error code, meaning that it tried to compile, it probably failed, and it's telling us why. And we don't consider that a complete error because actually the purpose of a code cell might be to demonstrate how great Elm's error messages are. So we pack up Elm's error messages and say, everything went great. It didn't compile, but here's what Elm told you, and you can show it to your user. Um, the other possibility is that some other kind of exception occurred, in which we say, in case we bundled up the string version of that exception, then we actually rethrow it to signal to the code we just looked at to say, hey, things really just fell apart. Please tell the user about that. So the next bit we'll look at is what actually happens in the compile code. I mean, you can imagine how this goes. We just call a subprocess and ask Elm make to do its work. So we just we won't go through all the details of pipes and standard else, but we're saying, Elm make, please execute this. Please compile this code we just uh, created. And it's going to put its output into the um, second temporary file that we created. Uh, it's called uh, output.js or something, or yeah, .js. Once that um, is created, we open it up. We read all of the code in the output into a, a variable called JavaScript. And we send a success report back to the user saying, hey, we got some JavaScript out. Here's what it looks like. Um, render it up on the screen. And I need to thank Noah for this. This was the, the, the last hurdle to get over to making this work was this magic bit of JavaScript code that I never would have come up with on my own because I'm a very much a neophyte to JavaScript. Um, so thank you, Noah, wherever you are for that. Um, without it, this wouldn't have worked. But 
this is effectively what gets shipped back to the user. They have a bunch of JavaScript coming out of the file that was created. We template it in where you see that you know, JS there in the middle, and we ship that back to the user. And that is actually what gets injected. In. We create a new DOM element then in the, in the space of the, the notebook, and then we inject or we mount the uh, Elm code into there. Um, when we want to report things back to the user, there's essentially a, a message queue that we can drop things into, this thing called IOPub socket. Um, so in the case of success, we ship back one bit of information saying, hey, I want you to create a new bit in the DOM here, this div with an ID, and the ID is generated using a, a unique number that we didn't really look at earlier, but it's there. So the, 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 the DOM is updated with this new div, and we also send back this bit of JavaScript and say, now mount this onto that div, and that's how things get shown up on the, the client. The good news is that it seems to work. Right? It, 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 I've been using it a few times. You saw it running in, um, you know, in, in production here up on the screen. And so it all, all the, the, the plumbing is fundamentally in place. And I'm pretty satisfied with most of how that works. And there are some things that definitely need some attention and thought, and I want to try to motivate you guys to look into that. Um, anybody watching the new Twin Peaks? Oh, it's good. Oh, it's good. Hello. Um, if you haven't seen it, that's not funny. So. Um, <laughs> Room for improvement. There are definitely some areas where I could use some help. Um, improved way of signaling compilation. It feels hacky to use a little comment line with this magic code that says, OK, please do the compilation now. I think we could use um, the metadata facilities that are built into the code cells, but I haven't had time um, to really dig into that. So I've just kind of put it on the back burner and created some issues for it. So if you're inspired or know anything about IPython notebooks or Jupyter notebooks, feel free to kick some ideas my way or a pull request. Um, ways to reuse code cells. Right now, when you line up a bunch of code cells and execute them, you lose all of those for future compilations. It might be nice to be able to say, these first three code cells are going to be reused for all the sub subsequent compilations. I think that could be very useful in certain situations. Um, because Elm's compilation model is different from Python's execution model, the, the mindset that people are going to come to Jupyter, uh, Elm, the Elm kernel from, is going to be informed by the way Python works, which is very dynamic, and things just kind of stick around in the namespace. The, the way we're doing it with Elm right now, we lose everything on every compilation. So it might be good to have this reuse facility. Better support for Elm package, uh, JSON. We actually have pretty good support for that now. I, I created this before. I pulled in a pull request. But now, if you have an Elm package.json in the directory with your code, uh, sorry, with your notebook, it will get used to pull down third-party dependencies. Automated tests, I've taken a swing at this and, and gotten halfway there, have again kind of run out of time to really make it work, but it would be nice to have something that just verified that the kernel was spitting out sane information. And this is maybe the biggest one, an Elm REPL experience, because there's sort of two ways that we interact with Elm code, right? We, we compile our Elm files into programs and we run them up in our browser, and then there's the Elm REPL, and I don't have an Elm REPL version of the, co of the kernel now. I think what we really would need to do this is just a second kernel that kind of does a lot of the same things, but is using the Elm REPL instead of Elm make at the end of the day. So those are the big, un uh, big kind of to-dos on my list right now. Uh, if you want to get involved, all of this is up on, um, on GitHub on, at the Jupyter Elm kernel under my name. Uh, things you can help with, just use it and let me know what you think. Let me know where it falls down or how it doesn't meet your expectations or does meet your expectations. I'd love to know that as well. Uh, feature ideas, bug reports, and the standard stuff, let me know, again, how it's falling over. If you want to send pull requests, yeah, I would like that very much. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, the, um, I guess we don't really have time for questions, so just talk to me afterwards if you want. Um, if you can get this full presentation as part of the kernel documentation. If you want to learn some Python, we've written a book, three books actually about Python, and you can get one at a discount at that link there. Um, and you can learn more about 60 North at our website. So thank you very much. Thank you.